To understand the Gospel of Matthew, we have to put the writer and that particular audience into some context. So this morning it may be helpful for us to hear Matthew in the context of concentric circles. The first circle, or the smallest, the, is the very small communities which were known as Jesus followers or the followers of the way in the early first century. And people gathered together in small groups in their homes. The second circle is Judaism. All of the members of the first group were participants and held faith in their Jewish ancestors and in that Jewish context. And so, prior to this text, there's a command by Jesus not to go to the Gentiles, not even to go to those awful, ugly Samaritans. The command is to go only to the house of Israel. And then there's another circle called Rome. And in particular, Rome is represented by Caesar. Caesar was called Lord, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And to hold that anything else or anyone else was Lord or Savior was treasonous. And treason was the crime for which people were crucified. And the final circle is the geography of the world. And at that time, of course, it was Rome. When Ma Matthew's gospel was written, the Jewish world was being torn apart by the military forces of Rome. In 60 CE, the Jewish state rebelled against Rome, and under the Roman Empire, Emperor Titus, Rome completely destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and everything that these Jewish people knew as religious. So remember when we read this text that the message is only to a certain group of people. Now there's a couple of words in this text that I think are important for us to know. There's a word, Beelzebul, and this needs to be distinguished from Beelzebub, which, you know, we think of Beelzebub as Smaug the dragon in The Lord of the Rings. Beelzebul is a descriptive word for not so nice a person. You know, the head of the household is a real SOB, and the reputation of the head of the household was imputed to the rest of the household. Specifically, things like morality and faith and the proper religious behavior. Another word is the word hell. And it's really our translation, the English translation of the word Gehenna. And we have this platonic or above and below understanding of this hell concept. But for Jews, Gehenna was a place where idolatry occurred. And in earlier history of Judaism, Gehenna was a place outside of Jerusalem known as the Valley of Hinnom. Now the Valley of Hinnom was a very horrendous place because it was used in previous historical and ancient times as a place where the pagans or non-Jewish people did all sorts of vile and wicked things, including burning children alive as sacrifices to the idols of Moloch and Baal. Now one section of the valley was called the place of the fire stove and that's indeed where the children were sacrificed. And if you want to know more about this, read Kings. It was a place of tremendous evil. And then when the Jews returned from captivity from Babylon, they turned this valley into a city dump. And so, like all city dumps that are burning, they continue to burn all along. And it just gets smoky. And that's kind of what is the concept of the Jewish concept of hell. It's not a place where you go. It's just a place which is a city dump. Which is a really interesting concept when you consider that when we get idolatrous, we kind of go to a city dump anyway. And then there's this have no fear of them language, which seems to be undefined by Matthew. But really, that them is the house of Israel, or the leaders of the house of Israel, to be more specific. And I think it can be a good inference that these are the ones with whom Jesus is always having trouble. These are the groups that have used religious faith as a way to control people 
and not to set them free. So that's just a taste of some of the things that the author of the Gospel of According to Matthew would assume that his audience would know. So as I read this text, does anything about this bother you given those interesting facts? A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master the head of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of the household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the mountaintops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet, are not, one of them, yet not one of them will fall onto the ground unperceived by your father. And even the hairs of your head, they are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny them before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and one's foes will be members of one's own household. For whoever loves the father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. I stand up here today with a little bit of trepidation. It's always harder to come back to First Central than you know. Um, there's a little bit of tradition here and a little bit of really excellent preaching. And I fully expect that next week when we come to church, although Grant and I and some of the kids won't be here, Scott will have these wonderful words that he has created for three weeks. So keep him to that, will you? I have just returned from a little sojourn in a place called Geneva. And I had to remind myself over and over again that it wasn't Switzerland. Geneva, Nebraska is a long way away. It's actually 125 miles from my house to my front door, my house in Omaha to my front door in Geneva. But it can be even further away than just the miles. I think you could talk to Stephen about that. Stephen's mother-in-law lives in Geneva. And Stephen's mother-in-law is, how do you say, how would you describe Margaret? Hair, yes, sir. You eat sing like this, right? Very outgoing. Very outgoing, that's what Stephen would say. Well, when I was in Geneva, whenever you're the interim minister, you're trying to make sure that things go okay. I was here when there was an interim minister, maybe, well, it was before Winston. And one of the things that we used to do is when the interim minister was here, we would introduce ourselves during the morning and we would shake somebody's hand and say, hi, I'm Bill Switzer, but that's really the interim. He's not here forever. So I try and avoid those kinds of things when I'm the minister. The other thing that happens to me as a minister is that I don't have knowledge of all kinds of people. And so when I was there in Geneva for maybe three or four weeks, I found this book. And it was a book of all the people who were listed in the congregation. It was called a covenant book. And the covenant book where, is where apparently some years ago they all signed this covenant book saying, I am a member of the church. 
Well, that was really good. And I thought, well, the kids would really like and enjoy knowing about uh, the, the other people that are in the church, right? So I sit down and I start paging through. And this one man, whose name is Jim, and Jim Steider was in the congregation in the morning and his wife, Kim, was there. And it was all well and good. And I thought, Jim, you're in this book. And underneath it is Cindy. Cindy, that must be his daughter. Well, um, the choir director was sitting in the front pew that day and she was going, It was his ex-wife. And I called Cindy his daughter. <laughs> Open mouth and insert foot. The other thing about interim ministers is that you get to do things a little avant-garde. And so I brought this morning to show you. Do you know what this is? Some people do, right? It's a double boiler, right? Now, for those of us who don't know what a double boiler, do you know what a double, no, no, we don't know what a double boiler is. Ah, you put water in here, and then you put like chocolate or candy in here, and you heat it up, and then it doesn't scorch. See, they're used to microwaves. <laughs> well, we had this funeral, and the lady's name was Marion, and Marion was a great lady. And so at the funeral, one of the things that the um, family wanted to do was to celebrate her life. And for years, when they were growing up, on New Year's Eve, they would all get around in their house and they would sing when the saints go marching in at New Year's uh, at 12 o'clock, okay? That was really a lot of fun for them. So they decided that at the end of the service, they were going to give and give everybody pots and pans in the, that came to the wedding, at the funeral. And then they would sing when the saints go marching in as they left. So it was really cool because you had all these people when the saints go marching in. Well, I was standing there and they said to me, well, where's your pan? And so they gave me this double boiler. So I had something to bang. Now what was really cool about that was is that from my conversations there on with these people, I was known not as the minister, but I was Double Boiler Bill. <laughs> it was great. I had a good time being Double Boiler Bill. Now there's a backstory to Marion's life, which was a little sad, but also a little bit more indicative of being in Geneva. Marion and her husband were married in the late 40s, and they had five children. And uh, the five children were successful, but one of the, the boys was gay. And when I met with the family in the terms of, at the time of the funeral, they would not acknowledge that he existed which was really sad, is that he was not listed as part of the survivors. And that was their idea, but I imagine, just imagine what it was like for Marion and her husband in the 1980s when he died of HIV AIDS and the amount of unsupport that the congregation could not provide because of who they were and the time in which they were. And so I bring this to you to say, you know, First Central really doesn't understand what it has. Doesn't understand what we have here. So that's what I've been doing for the last five, six, what seems like 25 years. Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Probably some of you know or can remember who Casper Melktoast was. You know, Casper is that comic strip and where the cartoonist uh, described Casper as the man who speaks softly and gets hit with the big stick. 
So, I've been thinking. How many people present today think that Jesus is a Casper Milk Toast kind of a character? Weak and bland and timid. How many of us think that Jesus was this uh, sentimental fool or he was wishy-washy or a guy who lived a long time ago was good at the time he was but he has really nothing to offer us today? Perhaps what we do is we imagine Jesus as gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Or maybe Jesus' personality is best communicated as oh gee, can't we all just get together and love each other? Can't we all just get along? Love. Come on. You know, never disagree. Leave everything as it is. We leave slavery as it is. We leave health care as it is. Or we leave the color of the new carpet red. Can't we all just get along? And when something difficult, of course, happens, we complain that the church is a place that shouldn't hurt people's feelings, and then we email the pastor like tattletales. Come on, I know some of you out there, raise your hand. Isn't this the image that we have of Jesus? Casper milk toast? Well, I, I understand it might be a little bit embarrassing. So, raise your finger. You know, your pointer finger. Right in front of you. And, and just wave it around a bit. Okay? The only person who can see it is me. The rest of the people can't see it. Come on. But I don't need any other fingers pointed at me. Understand? In Geneva, there's this little tradition that when you drive in, in a car or you're on the street and you're driving by somebody and somebody will flip a finger at you. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but it is quite disconcerting because you think they're flipping you off. But when really what they're doing is waving and acknowledging your presence. Well, I didn't think that when I first got there. So I don't need any fingers pointed at me anymore. Well, I don't know about you, but this text from Matthew really bothers me. I'm serious. Where does the writer of the Gospel of Matthew, or Jesus for that matter, get off telling me that if I am meant to be a disciple or a church member or a believer, that I have to give up my family? And what's this stuff about picking up my cross and following? Well, given the context of when Matthew was written, to whom it was written, and why it was written, What's going on here? If we hear the text as if we were living in the first century, maybe we would hear something that we haven't heard before. Maybe we would hear something like this. You are a valuable human being. In fact, you're so valuable that I know how many hairs are on your head. Or not. All of the rules the religious community develops and uses to make you feel less than who you are just kills your spirit. The torment of Gehenna occurs when religious rules and traditions become like idols, something to be worshipped. And even the Bible can be an instrument of idolatry, killing both the body and the soul of faith. And that's not the faith of Jesus in the God of Jesus. And it's not peace. It can be a sword. And quite frankly, it can be a sharp stick poked in your eye. And this isn't, can't we just all get along? We might also hear, if you think and you believe that your faith of the fathers that you profess is to be passed to you in exactly the same way so that you can be caretakers of the rules and how people are separated between the haves and the haves not. Think again. And the haves were, of course, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and the Romans. And there's going to be conflict if that's the message of Jesus. 
can't we all just get along kind of faith is not about the faith of Jesus nor the faith of that first community. Now, just in case you think that this is just for men, because Matthew would be written uh, to a Jewish community where men would have status, he also includes the thing about women, right? I think, Deb, it was just for you. Matthew was thinking into the future and said, Deb Kerwin, our mother who art in heaven, and this is just for you. Women are included when it comes to sometimes being, well, holding on to some of those traditions that need to be let go. When I was in seminary, the best advice was not in the academic realm that I ever received. I, I think I was in a doctoral level class with a man who had been in ministry for decades. And one day he said to me, Bill, if you never learn anything else from going to seminary, if you, you must learn that you never, 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 never mess with the women's fellowship. <laughs> and he didn't use the word mess. He used the F word. And maybe that's why I re remembered it for all these years. So I will tell you today that in the uh, announcements section, it says that the women's fellowship have presented the flowers in the sanctuary for today's service. And they are beautiful. <laughs> they don't exist, but they're beautiful. <laughs> and if you want to see a good example of how women are important in the carrying on of tradition and rules, see again Fiddler on the Roof. Golda is the character who must really approve of the change in, of the matchmaker tradition of how one marries. Tevia sets up this incredible dream scene so that Zidal can marry the man she loves, model the tailor, and not laser wolf, the fat old busher. But Golda changes the tradition and the rule that the matchmaker determines about who will marry whom. And both Tevya and Golda find that by losing that tradition, Zidal, their daughter, and model are given a life beyond that which is traditional and historical. Well, if we're also reading Matthew from the perspective of first century, that as far as one's taking up one's cross, this comes from and emerges from our worthiness and our value, not from guilt or imperfection. If we were in that first audience when the Gospel of Matthew was read, what would it mean that we have to change some of the things that we always see as traditional in order to be a part of the care and love of God? You see, in all four Gospels, Jesus' message was is that you don't need all of those rules and regulations to be in a relationship with God. And we don't need a mediator, a go-between with that, those that are the least entitled to a relationship with God. And also, it does not, Jesus never communicated that prosperity and cultural status is a symbol of God's approval. But we also have to be careful here with this cross thing. To take the position that it goes against everything that religious people claim to be as right, you know, it can, claim, it can be very dangerous. You know, if we claim or we see that everything should go according to what the governor of Texas tells us, we're in big trouble. It can be dangerous to take up the cross and talk about the injustice that comes from that kind of language. So far from being namby-pamby and wishy-washy, those who first heard the message of Matthew's gospel might stand up and say, it's about time. It's about time we heard the message about inclusion instead of exclusion. 
Do you remember that old joke about how many Jewish mothers it takes to change a light bulb? You remember that? None. Never mind. I'll just sit in the dark. <laughs> well, there's another saying. It's in the Roman Catholic tradition. And the joke is the same. How many Roman Catholic mothers does it take to change a light bulb? None. It's just another cross I have to bury. So often we read these words from Matthew and take them literally and apply them to our lives, often to our detriment, leaving Christian faith to be an excuse for separating for those who are in from those who are out and what it really means to live in community. I believe that we take from this text a view that God is not a bean counter. Not one who sits down and counts the hairs on our head, but instead we understand that God values each person, whoever they are, and no one is excluded. And maybe sometimes when we run into people who are excluding others, we need to take up the cross and call that into question. Now let me give you an example. Sally was 30-something. She had a 12-year-old son. And Sally's death was suspicious in that it could not be determined whether she took her own life or whether death was by accident. But it was an overdose, nonetheless. There are denominations who, in today's world, with all the knowledge we have and understanding of our brains and of our bodies, who shun and prohibited Sally's family, and in particular Sally's son, from a funeral in the church with all the rites, that's R-I-T-E-S, offered by the church. Now isn't that sad? But it happens even today. It's an exclusionary process. So if we take this text literally, then we have all kinds of problems. And quite frankly, it becomes a cultish activity that belongs in the Middle and the Dark Ages. And it is a Bible that is at its best at excluding people. And believe me, we can be mean toward each other. And it can be very unhealthy. And now I want to tell you something about being healthy. Granted, my job sometimes is to deal with unhealthy congregations, but in contrast, coming home to First Central is like seeing the grace of God work in marvelous and positive ways, and healthy ways. Do you know that? I don't think sometimes you do. You may not know this, but First Central does not understand that this place is a gifted and graceful community. It's a healthy place. People are welcomed here where in other faith communities they would be shunned. We know that. This church begins with an understanding of a person's worthiness, which is good theology. But there's a caveat that I always want to make sure you know. When you are welcomed here, do not imagine that this is a theology of, well, can't we all just get along? Do not be fooled into acting or believing that your opinion is the only opinion in this church. Which is a great thing. I was in a congregation where a man stood up during worship several years ago and said, the cabinet or whatever committee it was did not abide by the bylaws and therefore we should have a congregational meeting right now to outlaw that meeting. That exists. It does exist. It's exciting to watch here in this church all of these things that happen that are good and creative and certainly give us the grace of God. If you've been following our Facebook page for the past week or so, we've been sort of, there's been 
information that's been part of what is discipleship. And one of the quotes was that Jesus knew that following him was as unsentimental as duty. Well, I take issue with that because I really think that to be deemed worthy gives us more of a sense of love and care and compassion so that we can go into the world without fear. Where other churches are so scared to death that church is so awful and terrible and the minister is just going to beat you up. Because if there's one thing you also know in this church, if the minister thinks that the minister is going to have control of everything that goes on in this church, you are m mistaken. You know that. There will always be disagreements, and that's the gift. Jesus gives his disciples and that first community and Matthew and us a sense of worthiness, that we're a good person. Where before and historically we start out with unworthiness. If you want to look at that, the doctrine of original sin is unworthiness. It's not worthiness. It is not creation. It is not good. It is unworthiness. So the challenge is for us to see that we are worthy no matter where we are, no matter who we are, no matter where we are on life's journey. Amen.